going to talk about a topic which is rare in pediatric practice, but one which can have significant consequences overall. That is about thyrotoxicosis. Uh, so how common do you think, Dr. Vibha, is thyrotoxicosis in pediatric practice? So thyrotoxicosis is not basically very common in pediatric Yes, so roughly it's like one in 100,000. That is the sort of a figure. When we say thyrotoxicosis, uh, we used to earlier use the term hyperthyroidism. So why don't we use the term anymore, Naveen? Sir, basically thyrotoxicosis is elevated levels of thyroid hormones, hmm. which could be basically because of the increased production or because of the increased use. Hyperthyroidism basically increased production of the thyroid hormones. So when people used to say hyperthyroidism, it would basically mean that it is increased production. But we will discuss that many causes because of destruction of thyroid also, which is there. So what we'll do today is that we will use different case scenarios to highlight about the complexities in terms of etiology, evaluation, and management of thyrotoxicosis. The key question is, is it thyrotoxicosis? What is the TSH status? What is the cause? We'll go step by step from there. So to identify thyrotoxicosis, you should be aware that when should you consider. So most of us know that if there is weight loss, if there is hyperdefication, if there is tachycardia, tremor, sympathetic activity, we start thinking of thyrotoxicosis. But you should also be aware that if you have periodic paralysis, you should always think of thyrotoxicosis. And we'll discuss about one of those cases which may happen in that regards. Polyuria is also a manifestation of thyrotoxicosis, easy fatigability, worsening of uh, overall school performance, myasthenia, these are all other indications where thyrotoxicosis should be considered. If you have sudden rise in thyroid hormone, you will have a lot of problems which is known as thyroid storm. So in this scenario, if your thyroid was uncontrolled and you do a surgery or you do a radioactive iodine, suddenly a lot of thyroid, which is already there in the thyroid, will come into the body. And that is going to cause the thyroid storm. It can also happen in infection settings. Your levels of thyroid will go hugely high, up to 100, 200, 3, 4, 5 times, 10 times the normal. And that will basically cause a significant problem in the form of cardiac failure, hyperthermia, tachycardia, palpitations, atrial fibrillation. So all those complications will be there. There could be encephalopathy, arrhythmias, and you will have hyperthermia in that regard. Now, which test shall we do to screen for thyrotoxicosis, Dr. Vipa? TSH, uh, T3 and T3. Yes, so very importantly, as discussed, in cases of thyrotoxicosis, the TSH will be the first to go down. T4 will rise, but the rise of T3 will be much more. So if you just do FT4 TSH, you may still be confused. So in this scenario, you should do T3, FT4 and TSH. Why T3 and not FT3? Dr. Nani. So most assays of FT3 actually use a surrogate marker using T4. So they are not very good. So T3 total is what is recommended. Now the next status is, is it because of relief or production? So we need to know where the signal is coming. Is it TSH dependent or independent? Anybody whose FT4 is high, TSH should be zero, less than 0.1. So if it's undetectable, this is thyrotoxicosis. If it is on the higher side, any detectable, it is a TSH adenoma or resistance. This is what we've discussed. These are less than 0.01% of cases. So we won't be bothered about that. So most you will come there high FT4, low TSH. This is the typical picture you will see. Now from there, the biggest question that you have to answer is, is it Graves disease or it is thyroiditis? That is the big differential to look at. So in thyroiditis, because of antibody, viral infection, or bacterial infection, there is a damage. There will be no eye signs and goiter. It will be a milder disease, which is self-limiting. There will be no radionuclide uptake in that scenario. While if you have Graves' disease because of a stimulating antibody, you will have eye signs and goiter. It will be a severe disease. There will be increased uptake, and you would require antithyroid drugs to treat. So just to distinguish if it's a rapid course, if you have eye signs, if you have goiter, you've got very high levels of FT4, you have got brui, which is a marker of vascularity of the thyroid gland, you are mostly dealing with Graves' disease. If there is a milder symptoms, absent eye signs, absent goiter, no brui, 
marginally elevated ft4 it is most likely thyroiditis dr ruchira what is the most common cause of thyrotoxicosis with i signs you have got i signs and thyrotoxicosis most common cause graves we have discussed that na uh, viba what is the most common cause of thyrotoxicosis without i sign yes so you need to remember that even if the i sign is not there it can still be graves disease so you cannot just say no i sign does not mean that this is a uh, uh, thyroiditis rather than a thyrotoxicosis so radionuclide scan will tell you the picture in that regards so pointers against graves are no goiter age less than 1 year so less than 1 year like in diabetes we say if the age is less than 1 year think twice before you say it is type 1 it may be a maternal passage of thyroid or a tsh receptor activating mutation which can cause that and that will give you a picture now what about trab antibodies there are two types of antibodies which are measured one is a tsh receptor antibody the other is the tsh stimulating immunoglobulin trab versus tsi some people say tsh binding inhibitor immunoglobulin tbii what is the difference between tbii and tsi so basically bio was one is yes so when you say it is binding the tsh receptor it can both activate or inactivate but to prove that it is activating you need a bioassay so basically immuno assay you just see whether it will inhibit the tsh binding or not which is the assay which is there and you will study that this is a low cost now available in most platforms you can do this antibody it will not tell you whether it is increased production or not because it can be both blocking and stimulating but suppose you have somebody with graves disease and your these antibodies are positive it can't be blocking antibody it has to be stimulatory so if you use clinical sense you can use this also and get a good idea based upon that bioassays are actually you will use specific cell membranes which are going to produce cyclic amp so it's going to be very very complicated your trap will go there it will start acting and then levels will go up this is definitely gives you a functional status and it is very very expensive so the sensitivity which one will be more sensitive trap or the functional ones immuno assay will be more sensitive specific would be the bio assay because it will only be positive in graves it won't be positive in thyroiditis so if you have classical picture of graves and somebody says okay stimulatory antibody is negative you can then do a trab and you will know that this is positive because it's more sensitive but i would say there is very limited role in routine clinical practice to measure antibodies which condition it is very important so in the pregnancy so during pregnancy monitoring of mother this will tell you how much likely is the baby to develop those complications from that regard so graves versus thyroiditis limited role more in terms of pregnancy and earlier people used to say okay now the antibodies are negative we can stop treatment in that regards so thyroid scan is very important we can use both iodine and technetium it should be done if you have no i signs and no goiter and if you have a specific nodule if there is no uptake this is thyroiditis if you have increased uptake it is graves disease you may have a toxic nodule or you may have a toxic mng which will give you the diagnosis in that regards what about ultrasound limited role of ultrasound largely if somebody doesn't want to go for a thyroid scan which can be one condition in which a female will not not like to go for a thyroid scan or you would not recommend them to go for thyroid scan so if you have a pregnant woman with thyrotoxicosis if you have a doubt then you can look for the blood flow vascularity the other role where it is very effective is amiodarone induced thyroiditis there are two types of amiodarone induced thyroiditis one is thyroiditis second is increased production so their blood flow causes gives you a good information so nodule and goiter can also be characterized in that setting so before we start with cases the approach first thing is to look at nuclear scan if somebody has got a big goiter i sign very high ft4 you may say okay i don't have a facility easily available i don't need to do it otherwise scan should be done 
increase uptake with a solitary nodule is a toxic nodule multiple areas toxic mng and if it is diffuse uptake it's graves if it's decrease uptake look for tenderness no tenderness chronic yes sub acute very very tender very severe that's a rare scenario of acute thyroid we had this 18 year old male who presented with uh, recurrent episodes of uh, periodic paralysis in the last 6 months he had around 3 uh, to 4 episodes out of which uh, during the first uh, episode it was uh, followed it was basically started with pain followed by numbness and leading to paralysis and uh, the patient was administered iv fluids following which the uh, the patient started walking again and uh, in the subsequent uh, next month he also had the similar complaint of the lower limb pain followed by numbness and paralysis and uh, the same history followed and uh, the <clears throat> treatment was uh, iv fluid following is the patient improved so when whenever the patient had any form of lower limb pain he used to rush to the doctors to get uh, himself hospitalized and uh, and <clears> how <throat> however the cause of the paralysis was not identified and in addition to the paralysis the patient was also worried about his weight loss about which there was a weight loss of around 3 to 4 kilos in the last 6 months and he was also felt weak he had a history of lethargy and he used to have palpitation and there was a history of uh, chronic diarrhea in the form of increased frequency of about 7 to 8 times per day in the last 3 to 4 months and there was no history of any polyuria there was no history of any recurrent abdominal pain or hematuria and there was no history of headache blurring of vision breathlessness to rule out any form of hypertension and uh, with regards to the past history there was no any history of significant hospital admission prior to the uh, prior to the uh, first episode of uh, paralysis and there was no history of any diabetes or hypertension and there was no history of any chronic drug intake in the form of basic diuretics and there was no any significant uh, for family history with uh, regards to periodic paralysis on examination then tremors were present and tachycardia was present with the pulse rate of 124 mm which was regular and had a normal volume and there was no goiter no eye signs and rest of the examination was normal and the bp was found to be normal and with regards to the investigations uh, the basic screening workup which was done previously in the outside hospital was normal and we got an vbg done which uh, showed normal vbg with normal <clears throat> base excess and bicarbonate levels and we got a thyroid function test test done which showed uh, elevated ft4 in the presence of suppressed tss level so the uh, considering the symptoms uh, it was more likely to be thyroid obstructive and the uh, result was also the same and uh, <clears throat> since the patient had a history of around 6 months uh, presenting with recurrent episode of paralysis it was uh, more likely to be a graze rather than other form of thyroid itis and a uh, nuclear scan was done which was suggestive of graze disease and the patient was started on methimazole therapy so in the subsequent follow up the patient was diagnosed with uh, thyrotoxicosis in uh, september 2017 where the patient was started at uh, methimazole of uh, <clears throat> 20 mg bd which uh, it was around 0.5 Six milligram per kg per day. Following which, uh, in the next subsequent uh, one or two years, the patient uh, dose reduced to the minimum of for about ten uh, milligram once a day. And uh, the, we felt that the patient was uh, for showing remission. But suddenly, uh, we found that the uh, dose requirement increased. And when we even increased the dose, we found that the patient uh, thyroid stasis were not controlled. The patient still had persistent thyrotoxicosis. so when uh, when we found that we decided to uh, uh, <coughs> go in for radioactive ablation so when we got that uh, done in the month of september 2019 and uh, we uh, this radi- iodine 131 was given at uh, 8 micro pure units and uh, we repeated the test after 2 months despite uh, giving radioactive iodine the patient did not show any improvement there was a <coughs> elevated level of free t4 and suppressed tsh so we decided to repeat the radioactive iodine and uh, when we repeated in uh, december 2019 we found that the thyroid function normalized in the subsequent month we found that the patient went into hypothyroid uh, in the month of april and the patient was started on uh, thyroxine but however unfortunately uh, after one year of uh, <coughs> the radioactive iodine therapy we found that the still the patient had uh, relapsed and uh, the patient had one more episode of thyroid toxicosis third Third dose, 
despite two two cycles of radioactive iodine in uh, again uh, we started we gave we went asked him to go in for another cycle and uh, since december 20 he uh, there is no any relapse and the patient is maintained uh, we on your thyroid status with the help of thyroxin what was the periodic paralysis dr nagin in uh, thyroxin process so it is basically due to the channels which are basically affected in calcium channels that are uh, mainly involved in patient with thyrotoxic process sir okay so there are a hypersensitivity of the potassium kir channels which basically and then you have a severe hypokalemia so what is the usual predisposing factors for that sir so when would they stern as exercise when so exercise, exercise and the increased sympathetic activity. activity so when your sympathetic activity goes down the sodium potassium atp also gets activated So lot of sympathetic activity which increases will cause that. Then you can have issues like increased intake of protein, right? And carbohydrates. carbohydrates. Why carbohydrates? If you have lot of glucose, so lot of glucose insulin will release, which is basically precipitate hypokalemia. So this is more common with adolescents, young age group, typically eighteen to twenty-five years of age group, and they, this is a recurrent episode which improves with that. That was one major issue in that regard. The second was with regards to the recurrence after iodine therapy. What do you think was the reason for that? Sir, adequate dose was. So sometimes what happened is this fellow never had a normal thyroid after the initial radioactive iodine. Yes, sir. Had to be given I think three times. Three times, yes, sir. In total, so this is also unusual, but happens more in people who have got very high. His FT4 used to go up to hundred. Yes. <clears throat> which means he required a higher dose for correction in that. So if you have anybody. Who has got recurrent periodic paralysis? So you asked about history for RTA, which is the other possible cause. You should also think of a possibility of uh, uh, these abnormalities in the.